Hi, I'm Alex Mitchell and I'm the creator of Cancer Stories. Cancer Stories is a video diary program which is designed to help people like yourself manage their cancer. And the key aim is to record previous patients' experiences, really a wide variety of cancers. And these are patients who are genuine real patients from Leicestershire who've given their consent to uh, allow us to record their story onto DVD or the internet. What we ask those patients is really to give a brief account over 30 or 60 minutes. How did they manage with their diagnosis? And hopefully by watching their account, you'll be able to pick out some common themes from one or more of those videos. And those common themes might be things like what resources are available locally or nationally, or how do families cope, or how do people themselves manage with those awkward stages, either the initial diagnosis or the complications of treatment, or perhaps um, psychological and emotional complications, which are sometimes overlooked. So overall, we hope that by watching the video diary program, you'll be able to take some positives from other people's accounts, and hopefully that will help you better cope with your situation, whatever that is at the current time. Thanks for watching. Hello, I'm John Butcher. I have been a cancer patient and I'm hopefully on the road to recovery. Little did I think I would ever be in this situation. I am now 61 years old. I was born in a small village in South Northamptonshire where I was, went to primary school. I was, I then my family moved to rugby because of my father's work commitments. I went to grammar school there and later went to the University of Birmingham to read geography. The idea initially was to be a town planner. That never happened and I eventually be, did a postgraduate certificate in education and became a school teacher. I taught for two years in a comprehensive school in Stevenage in Hertfordshire before securing a position at Oakham School, a major co-educational public school in the East Midlands. I think I certainly was fortunate. I taught geography and also took some games, which have been a major part of my life. Rugby, cricket, football, hockey. I enjoyed them all. I st probably stayed at Oakham School far too long but it was a good experience. I was there for 34 years in total. I became a fixture. It was never my intention to stay that long initially, but I did. And it was a good place to work, a friendly place to work. And in fact, as the years progressed, I became a fixture. And then, in 2009, things started to go a little wrong. First of all, I was in hospital with regard to pains in my neck. And blood pressure issues came along. I approached that year, academic year, starting 2010, with the intention of retiring. One year early, as Oakham School allowed. It had been agreed financially and that I would go. Sadly, things were not to, to progress quite as I hoped. And in as much as my sister has been able to enjoy her early retirement, I was not going to be able to. For I fell ill. And all that now follows uh, is my story. Hello, 
I'm John Butcher. I was born in Northamptonshire in a very small village, but moved to Rugby in Warwickshire uh, when my father's work made it difficult uh, to commute. I was educated at Orange Chef School in Rugby and then went to the University of Birmingham where I read a degree in Geography. I then did a postgraduate certificate in Education. My first teaching job was in Stevenage in Hertfordshire where I spent two years. I then moved to Oakham, Oakham School, where I, where I taught for 30 or 4 years before having to retire. I have an elder sister and both my parents are now sadly deceased. I am now 61 years old. In 2009, in late September 2009, I started to experience backache. I thought nothing of it. I'd had a lot of sporting injuries over the years and thought it was just an old war wound, to put it bluntly. However, from one weekend into, the, into a week, it started to worsen and it worsened badly. And I had to leave work early on one Tuesday afternoon. It was, became excruciating and I fell onto the floor and I had to crawl to the phone to summon help from my friends in the Department of Geography at Oakham School. They came and I was taken to Leicester Royal Infirmary where things get a little foggy, probably because I was in such a state. My back was killing me and I, all I remember is having a pain-killing injection and then somehow I went home. But how and why, I don't know. The next thing I found out was that I had, to ha I had an x-ray and a scan and I found that I'd got a tumour in my bladder. I was duly summoned to Leicester, Raw, Leicester General Hospital and it was removed and this occurred in early November. I still thought that I was be all over and done with it, it would be benign and I would return to work at the start of the spring term in January. However, I waited the best part of a month and was summoned again to Leicester General. I was quite happy that morning. In fact, it was a bright morning. A little chilly, perhaps. I recall it well. Anyway, I was duly summoned and I met, for the first time, a consultant, a Mr. Summerton. There were two other people in the room, I remember. There was a nurse and a lady, I'm not quite sure of her job, but she seemed to be a very friendly lady called Lisa. I was introduced to her, I recall that. Mr. Summerton then, somewhat bluntly, I thought, in hindsight, and at the time, told me I had cancer. Uh, I burst into tears. There was a discussion about which I cannot remember anything, but I then followed that I went I was taken around by Lisa to x-ray departments and to have blood pressure taken. I was in floods of tears. Absolutely, I was distraught. How I stood up, I do not know. I was given cups of coffee, I recall that. Anyway, eventually it was time to go home. I phoned my sister and her response to when I told her I got cancer was hysterical laughter almost as if it was disbelief, in disbelief. I somehow managed to get home, driving myself. But rather than go home, I went to school. I was greeted by the PE department, and the PE department took me under their wing for a matter of two or three hours, trying to talk to me, embracing me. Yet they didn't know what to say. What do you say to someone who's been told they've got cancer? Even then, questions like, why me? What had I done wrong? It was almost as if cancer, I felt guilty. Okay, perhaps I was, because I'd been an inveterate pipe smoker for years. And following the family tradition, my father and grandfather smoked pipes galore. Anyway, I eventually was to make my way home. And there I waited and sat. I told others by phone, and I emailed a few people. The next things then moved very swiftly, because I was then summoned to the chemotherapy department, 
and that was in less than two weeks, which was as they had promised. And I was taken into chemotherapy. Very early one morning, I had to get there for right at the start of the day. I was told my chemotherapy would be long. I didn't say quite how long until I got there. It turned out to be eight hours involving, um, well, saline solutions and then the, the I dare say, the, well, I'm not sure what the chemical was, but I always remember it was in a brown covered bottle, flask, and I sat there and I remember the, the material being put through a cannula in my left hand and I got ticked off for moving my hand because the cannula came loose and the poor machines would bleep if, you, if they came loose. Well, after eight, the first eight hours, I was told I might feel a little unwell. I'd been taken to Leicester General by a colleague and was picked up because I told, was told I might not be able to drive home. I might be unsteady. All I remember is feeling cold, very cold. Well, I went home and the coldness was unbelievable that evening. And I remember going to bed quite early that day, that night, two hot water bottles, blankets on top of the duvet, and it must have taken the best part of two hours to get warm. Well, I'd had my first dose of chemo and I was told that I was going to have three batches consisting of chemo twice. So it would take six weeks with one week in between each. So and eventually the treatment would last nine. Well, I enjoyed Christmas with my mother and my late mother and my friend in rugby. In early January, just prior to my next chemotherapy, I was sat there watching TV and my temperature, I thought I ought to take my temperature because one was told to take it very regularly. I took it with my little boots thermometer and sadly it was over 37 and a half degrees C. Oh Lord. I thought the thermometer's gone wrong. I'll take it again. Oh no, it was still over 37 and a half. So following their instructions, I followed, I phoned the hospital and they said, come in. I then had a joyful two days on, on antibiotics in the, chemo, in the ward that adjoins the chemotherapy unit at Leicester Royal. That was quite, quite acceptable. It was quite painful, painless, apart from being sat there with these bottles. The nurses were tremendous. I always remember that. They were lovely Zimbabwean ladies. Well, after, it was a Saturday afternoon and I was sent home and all was well. And I started back on my chemotherapy. And that was through the January of 2010. It was on the second circuit of these chemotherapy groups of two, three chemotherapy. Um, I then got a cold and was told that I couldn't have chemotherapy and have to go back home. Anyway, the doctor, whose name I've forgotten, a nice chap, uh, said to me, well, you will separate the doses out a bit. We're probably giving you too much at once. This is a lot to take in. So they increased the gaps between the various chemotherapy treatments. But by the end of January, early February, the chemotherapy was nearly over. And by that time, my long-term friend abandoned her life in Oxford and decided to come and live with me and look after me. And Talat has been with me now for the best part of three and three and a half years. Without her, I don't think I would have survived. Chemotherapy stopped. And there then had to be a blank of about six to eight weeks. I was told that chemotherapy would not sort my problem out. It would merely reduce the size of my bladder. In the meantime, I met Mr. Cockleberg, who was going to be my consultant, an interesting character. Of that, there is no doubt. Much more amenable than Mr. Somerton, I have to say. I felt that here was a man who knew what he was doing. I trusted him to the nth degree and knew I would have to 
because clearly I was not well. At the time, I didn't feel unwell at all. You've, you've, you've explained in quite, in quite a lot of detail what's happened so far, but then a new um, urologist came along and started treating yes. you. Well, what happened from that point? At that point, I knew I was in a situation of going to have a bladder operation, and it was a question of what type of operation I was going to have. Mm. What options were you given? Then? I was given two options. One, whereby I would have a stoma bag fitted to my side, and or secondly, an operation that involved the creation of a studer pouch. Mr. Kolkberg the consultant mentioned that the Studer pouch as probably the most preferable option, the more preferable option, because of the fact I was not old. I thought it was slightly curious, but there we are. And it in, he explained what it involved. And it was a relatively, is a relatively new operation, as I found out somewhat later, involving taking part of my bowel and making that a new bladder as my bladder. I recall prior to the operation, they have actually marked an X on my body where they would put a stoma bag if they could not do the Studer operation. And they would decide during the operation which they could do. And well, I, can get, I would now go to hospital. Now on, it was April the 20th, 20th, I went into hospital. I went to hospital on uh, Leicester General the day before the operation, which is a bit unusual. The reason will come to light now. Back in February of 2010, it was decided that emotionally I was a little flawed now and needed help. And it was from February that the psycho-oncology service came to my rescue. And they have carried on coming to my rescue, aiding me through the passage of time since that date. Anyway, back to April the 21st. So I was in, I was sat, stood there early in the morning in the ward and Mr. Cockleberg came in to see me and he said, you're here then? I said, yes, everybody has got me here now. He said, are you ready? I said, as far as I know. And I recall I walked to the operation because I knew I would be going back, not to the ward, but to a high dependency unit. It's almost as if I I was walking to Calvary. You were anticipating that there would be a significant operation then? Oh, yes. And you were, you were told by the staff at that yes, time? Yes, I was. Mm. And I even recall seeing the beds in the ward, which were the dependency beds that were close to the nurse's station. Mm. And I realised I would be there. Mm. That is very harrowing. Anyway. I, there I strode into the operating theatre. There was an absolute barrage of people. Law. There was people everywhere. And there was a very kind nurse who, who had me sat on the trolley. And I was told I was going to have an epidural. And just to sit very still. And she said, you will feel drowsy. She said, hold the cushion. And there were a number of anaesthetists there. And dare I admit it, there was one very pretty girl. Um, indeed. Anyway, the upshot of it all was, the next thing I knew, I was coming to in the high dependency unit and a nurse was looking at me. It was dark. It was just a small light on. Uh, and I don't think I came to for very long. And off I went to sleep again. I was there for three days. On the third day, my sister, brother-in-law, brought my ancient mother into the hospital. And I have no idea what I look like, 
but I can recall my sister going absolutely white. And my big brother-in-law strode forward manfully and shook my hand, as if to say, well done, little man. And probably he was right. Very right. What was the next step after you recovered from that surgery? I was then taken down into the high dependency beds in Ward 28, mm -hmm. I think it was 28. And I was there for a handful of days, including the worst day of my life. On the Sunday after my operation, this is hard, I became ill. Uh, the problems were quite simple. I had about four tubes in at the upper frame part of my body and a similar number at the lower end. And there were leakages. I was crying. I recall that. And then I started to be sick and sick and sick and sick and I vomited. They gave me anti-sickness drugs. The junior doctor was at a loss. The nurses were at a loss. And that Sunday evening, I phoned my friend Tal at a home in Oakham and told her to expect the worst. Somehow they put huge bandages on my sides to try and soak up any leakage from wounds. I was not in a good state. I thought my number was up. I can recall a voice across the ward in the dark of that night saying, John, for God's sake, hold on. Somehow I must have done. Very early, about quarter to eight, eight o'clock on the Monday morning, doctor came in and what they did was to reinstate a tube that they'd removed through my nose. And his expression was, we're trying to divert the vomit southwards. Nice way of putting it. My friend Tallet arrived at quarter past eight in the morning with another friend to see how I was. And would you believe I smiled, having been through a night of hell. There was also at the time, a new set of nurses came on. And one nurse in particular took, looked at my various problems with leakages from tubes and set about doing something about it. It took her three quarters of an hour to come to put together three or four very small bandages, which absolutely changed my life. I will be indebted to that Malaysian lady or Filipino lady forever. I've, only, I've seen her a number of times since. I don't think she recalls quite what she did for me, but she, she was my savior. I spent three or four more days in that area where you were close to the nurse's station. Now in that ward, they have a nice curious system of whereby when your problems are less severe, you gradually get moved further away from the nurse's station. And so I was moved. I should add, I'd had a number of visitors. Not only my friend had come to see me, my close friend, but friends from school had come on a virtual rotor to come and see me. I was informed there was a Facebook page been opened. Mr. Butcher, the legend, <laughs> it still exists. <laughs> Over 400 people had signed up to it. And I recall thinking, and they'd apparently left messages. I recall thinking, I better get well. These people are depending on me for God's sake. And they were all sorts of pupils I'd taught, old Okamians, masters, mistresses of the school. It almost as if I felt responsible to get better again, slightly bizarrely in some respect. Anyway, after about 10 days, I was, I, they sent me home. I still had all sorts of tubes connected and I'd been given instructions on how to flush my system. I should add at this time, I'd been told 
that not only had my bladder been removed, but they'd also removed my prostate, prostate gland, because they'd found in the operation that it had been infected. And that would cause me a few issues later. What did they tell you about your cancer type or staging? It was considered to be a grade three cancer, just on the entrance to my bladder. Mm. Uh, the lower entrance, the exit entrance, the exit of my bladder. And that was considered, I would, they, were only, I was, they said I would be probably have lived for a painful year had I not been operated on. Um, it's kind of brought it home to me. Anyway, I went home with piles of kit to sort my flushing of my system out. Mm. Um, my good friend had to help me do it. I was told by the nurses how to do it. Um, and in fact, they used to watch me do it. In fact, Mr. Cockleberg watched me do it once uh, and he was amused. Uh, I was a bit of a celebrity, I felt. I then went back into, ho I went home and I was home for about hmm, 10 days, 12 days, might have been up to a fortnight. And then I had to go back to have all these, this external plumbing removed. They did it very quick. I thought they'd do a few checks on me, but no. Within a day, I had all sorts of things taken out of me. And then I realized one of the problems I was going to have. I'd been warned that I might have some incontinence issues. And lo and behold, did I have them. Mm. And it's because I'd lost my prostate and I'd lost a valve system to control the problem of urine. Anyway, everything seemed to be working all right. I was put on a lot of drugs. They weren't painkillers. They were anti-acid drugs. For apparently with this operation that I had involving this Stuta pouch, you get mucus in the urine and you need to take anti-acid tablets for to break it up. It's not a known qu quality of anti-acid tablets, apparently, but it's been found to work. It does. Anyway, while I was in that second stage in hospital, lo and behold, I got an infection. Antibiotics blasted into me. And then that upset my blood count and I had to have two blood transfusions. So when my poor lady came to see me, she was a bit horrified to see various things going back into my system. I sat there quite blasé, bizarrely enough, about it all. Was I on the road to recovery? Had I turned a corner? Perhaps I had. It was remarkable how stoical I became um, I don't know quite why. In the hospital scenario, despite the food, I was getting really quite strong in my mind. I knew it wouldn't last because I've been of an uneven temperament in my life. Anyway, I went home. No external plumbing now, but with hordes of kit, largely consisting of, I suppose you could call them like great pads, urine pads, um, tablets, and various other items. The, at this point, I was handed over to district nurses. This was, became a little harrowing because when I explained to them what I'd had done to me, no one had ever heard of the operation. That shocked me. But when I look back on it now, the fact that the surgeons only do about a dozen of these operations a year doesn't surprise me now. I told them what I'd had done to me. It turned out I was the only one in Rutland. A dubious honour, uh, perhaps. Anyway, this problem of incontinence was really quite bad, particularly in the evening times. And 
it was a district nurse who suddenly came up with the idea of convene bags overnight. And to this day, I still use them. For one of the problems is I do not have a control mechanism for urine. It operates through gravity and whatever. I have no valve system. I've been through a lot and I suppose it was then that I suddenly started the physical situation was improving. There's no doubt of that. I was getting stronger. Yes, I'd lost tons of weight while I was in the hospital, but suddenly I was starting to get more back my shape. Emotionally, it took a while to realize just how harmed I was. The shock of being, being ill, the shock of being told I had cancer, the shock of chemotherapy, the shock of the operation, which it turned out last, had lasted for over six hours and it involved three surgeons. The external plumbing. The knowledge that incontinence would always be with me. It might get a little better over time, they said. I had to take tablets. I was alive, I suppose. So things weren't quite so bad. And it was the summer and I could sit in the garden. I was very slow to get moving, to get walking, for any movement seemed to upset my incontinence. But slowly through that summer, it, what, it did get better. I was receiving emotional help. Let's discuss this, um, these emotional aspects and mm. how people cope with um, you know, a very difficult situation. I recognise not just the diagnosis, but everything that comes with it in the surgery and the complications. Yeah. How, do you, how did you personally manage in that situation? There are two aspects to this. Firstly, one has got, I've, in hindsight, getting over the physical problems is one issue and I suppose I could see that I was getting recovering from that. Yes there are still problems and prob always will be. In dealing with the emotional aspects probably I am more scarred in some respects emotionally than I am physically. It occurs at odd times. I hate Sundays because Sunday was the day when I was so bad. I still get flashbacks to that dreadful day and seeing the problems I was having. One of the issues also was that I was planning on early retirement. Cancer had intervened and all the things I may have had planned for my retirement were scrapped. Mm. That, that can be a big issue because you were um, making reasonably clear plans and I had many suddenly plans. interfered with by yes. this diagnosis was essentially yes. out of the blue, wasn't it? Yes. It was almost as if my glorious retirement has been, was taken from me. That is still very hard to deal with. And I have found that I get very quickly upset. And I suppose the question of why me, what did I do wrong to have cancer still comes. But of course it's a silly question. It's bad luck, along with a few other contributory factors. And one needs to find something to interest you. It's not easy in my situation, given the side effects of my operation. Every now and again, things just get a bit too much. 
and I need a calming word. I need a team captain sometimes just to say, come on, you're okay. It mustn't be any more than that because I know I'm not 100% and never will be again. So the old comment that like, buck your ideas up would, would, is awful, is not appropriate. I did, I do have one or two interests that have helped me cope. I was a keen sportsman and I could walk down to the, well, I could drive down to the local cricket ground, sit on a chair and watch cricket. I also am a keen photographer and I could take pictures of sport, both at the school where I used to work and at the local town grounds. No one seemed to mind. In fact, I was much in demand uh, and prompted to buy a new camera. I still do that to this day. I've had pictures printed in newspapers. Some people think I'm really rather good, but I think it's by accident really rather than by design. There is no doubt that having been through what I have, people, you need to find interests or interest that you can do that doesn't make life too difficult for you. When I'm at a cricket ground or by a rugby match, I can forget my problem. A wet day at home, when only all you can do is perhaps watch the TV or read a book, it's not a good day. Because you can start thinking, or you realize you have to go to the loo again. And after an hour or two, again, and then, because I use my tummy muscles, where people have normal systems, I suffer some bouts of upset tummies, and things start to come, make it bad again. Um, so where possible, you'd advise people to keep occupied, keep busy, have a role? Find a role, mm. if you can. Find an interest, if you can such that I know you, I know I need to sit quietly sometimes, but things can get a bit much. Mm. What would you say to those people who say, um, well, that's all well and good, but I'm, I'm feeling tired with my condition or, you know, I don't have the motivation, you know, I'm feeling too unwell to try anything, but that, that problem is dragging on for a long time. You've got to say, come on. I can, I should, if only for the sake of those who are trying to look after you. Yes, it can be very difficult, but sometimes, you'd, even if it's a question of just saying, well, that I'll get over this day, tomorrow will be better. I can't plan and haven't been able to plan in the long term. You plan in the short term. Mm -hmm. Short term gains is the way forward, uh, are the way forward. Even that can be a bit difficult mm -hmm. when the weather's bad, it's snowing. People if, might be interested to hear how much you've been able to get back to normal, right. having had all these um, you know, procedures and complications. Getting back to normal. Well, the trouble in my case of getting back to normal was the fact that I'd gone into retirement. Mm. So there was no normal it for me. It was a me. new phase of life. Please. It was a new, f what was to be a joyous phase of life as the old, silly old retired school teacher, the little man, had gone into retirement. I had to face two challenges, a retired life and a life after cancer. That's not always easy. And I still reckon that I am still sorting it out and will do. Mm. For most retired folk, let's be truthful, have spent some of their lovely bonus on retirement. 
mm -hmm. on going on a cruise. I can't do that uh, and won't be able to do that for a while. I accept that. And in fact, I'm a bit loath to move too far at all. I've been on virtually no holiday since my operation because I know the pro I have to take all the kit with me. Pads, convenes, all this must travel with me along with my tablets. You have to force yourself in some occasions. I can do afternoons or mornings. Uh, and then I'm quite happy to go back. Two or three hours break from home can be very critical indeed. Um, even if it is to talk to someone else, hmm. apart from the partner and carer. Um, so you would advise people to seek an outlet? To seek an outlet, to seek other people, hmm. uh, if they can. But you know in your heart of hearts the people you go back to are the real mainstays of your life. Sure. And in some respects, they need advice and help as much as you do. Mm, mm. Because most of them will never have had the experience of a partner, a relative, who are in your state. And sometimes it's difficult to tell them just how you are. You t sometimes you don't want to, mm. because you don't want to upset them. Mm. What do you think the role of meeting other patients who may be in a similar situation? Well, I've only ever, I've never met one. I've seen, the there was a gentleman who had the same operation as I did on the same day. We met twice uh, after the operation. And I hope he is well. Because on those two occasions, he looked very sick mm. and very sad. In hospital, I was the sad one, and he was the strong one. Mm -hmm. And there's been a reversal somewhere. I would not describe myself as being strong now. Mm. I'm better than I was. I do get out. People do. There is one question you always get asked, though. How are you? Every time I meet someone from my old school, it's the first question. Or they say, you're looking well. And sometimes you think, don't need to say it. Um, just say hello, good morning, it's cold. Because you can get reminded of it. You don't want to be. You prefer still not to be reminded or asked too much about I don't it. want to be asked too much. How do you feel if you see items about cancer in the news or in the press? Anything medical gets immediately turned off. I have an embarrassing reluctance to know much about hospitals and whatever now. It's almost as if I had my fill. I did my bit. And I know, I prob although I probably could go through it all again, there's no way on this earth I'd want to try. Mm. It took too much out of me physically and emotionally. But there again, I was given a year to live. In April of this year, 2013, it will be three years since mm. I had my operation. There you go. And that is a critical issue. There I go. And I'm still with it. Um, I still can be as cynical as hell as I always was. Um, I do probably get sad sometimes and want to cry a bit. I do get emotional about other people's death. When my mother died just over a year ago, funnily enough, I managed that quite well. It was hers was a relief from suffering. She hadn't cancer, she was just old. I have to admit, the hospital where she has didn't look after her very well. Unlike the hospital experience I had. I'm not saying that was 100% perfect. And I would love to talk to the Minister of Health and tell him what he ought to do to Leicester General. I could have written in the time I was there a massive treatise on the subject of Leicester General Hospital. But within that system, there were some extraordinary people. And 
you're never in a position to go up to them and thank them sufficiently well. It's now, as I say, three years since I had all this. Issues still carry on, and they probably will. It's never going to be easy or straightforward, my life. I'm always going to have issues. There is a course, sometimes you think, would it be better if I died? Then the following day the sun comes out and it's the cricket season and things are a bit better again. Well, it's nice to hear you can still enjoy certain things even though some days may still be a struggle. You have to make the most of those days. Mm. Uh, because, but you cannot predict when you're going to have a bad day. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't follow a pattern, apart from my problem with Sundays. Um, and I don't know what I'll ever be able to do about that. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that you need, people like me need help for a, longer than most people think. Mm -hmm. And even if it is only a few words of encouragement, They can help a lot. Mm. What do you think we need to improve in the health service, having seen it firsthand? I mean, what are the gaps that were obvious to you? Well, when I was in hospital having my operation, the clear issue always was twofold. Night cover and weekend cover. Let alone issues about food which, let's be truthful, is appalling in all the hospitals I've been in, and it doesn't get any better. I felt very sorry for some of the nurses who were on night duty and at the weekends. There were too few people there. Easily too few. Mm -hmm. It's also clear, became clear to me that the way in which consultants look at you varies tremendously. And I could see that across the ward as I lay there on my bed or sat there. Mm. I was fortunate. I think some are not necessarily so. In broad terms, how would you describe that feeling that you get from the medical staff? In my own case, and I, I'm quite happy to applaud Mr Terry, who was my urologist, who tried to conquer my incontinence issues about which I haven't spoken too much and Mr Cockleberg's team were first class there is no doubt that uh, I don't think I saw others who didn't quite get the same clearly nurses vary some were so good and probably I wonder if they get recognised mm. That saddens me that possibly they don't. Um, and you can't say it's, it's it, the more experienced nurses are better than the less experienced. It doesn't follow mm -hmm. at all. Mm. Individuals matter. And some individuals whose their help they gave me, I will never forget. And if I could pin a gold badge on them, I would. Uh, they deserve the lot. What do you see in the future for yourself? In the future for myself, I know I've got the issues of incontinence. Mr. Terry, a urologist to whom I was uh, passed to, we discussed the possibilities of my having another operation, but they came to the conclusion it would cause some, could cause so much more hassle and the possibilities of infection that I should carry on as I am. I'm classed as might, light to moderate. Some days are better than others. It depends how much I drink, how much I move around, how much I bend down. For the future, what do I want? What do I hope? I hope some of the memories become more distant. They are. I wish I could bound about quite like I used to. Never gonna happen, but it'd be nice. I hope 
that some insurance company will let me go abroad and take my camera. Z in the plural. Are now. we stopping that right now? Yes, I can't. Or are you personally cautious? I can't get hot. Are you personally cautious about it? I am cautious and I know insurance companies are cautious because that was the one thing I was going to do in my retirement, um, even if it was only going to see a football match. Uh, I would love to have done it. And as an ex-geography teacher, interest in the landscape was profound. And that's gone. But perhaps I will be able to go and see some things. There are some things I can still enjoy. I enjoy fine food. And one thing I can still do is go to a fine restaurant. And I can. And I relish it. But to be seen around cricket grounds and rugby grounds and hockey pitches with my camera and hearing the words of thank you, you're here again. And I know my pictures have now been through parents of children at Oakham School have been sent all to all four corners of this earth. It's very gratifying mm. to find an in, although my partner thinks it's a bit mad, but there again, photography is. I do have worries about whether cancer will come back and how whether I would ever have to go through it again. Hopefully that won't happen. With help, I'll carry on. And there's no question when you have cancer, when you go through it, when you've been through it, having someone there is extremely important. Mm. Even if it is religious faith, mm -hmm. uh, I think is very significant and not to be underestimated or undervalued at all. Mm. by even the providers of those care, that care, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the people who manage them ought to realise just how severe it is. Um, it's life-changing, life-destroying, and I don't think sometimes perhaps administrators and people beyond realise just how bad it can be. Because mm. no, when you hear that someone's had cancer, going through it, you, of course you're, you're concerned, but it's not until you actually have had it yourself uh, and you've seen things from first hand, you realise just how awful it is. Mm. Um, but there I am, three years on, uh, and hopefully carry on. Well, I know your story will be very important to those people who are watching. We haven't had anyone before who's come to tell us about bladder cancer. So just on that note, it's really uh, valuable. But thanks for being so honest and open about your situation and telling the viewers um, how to manage and being honest about the complications and how to deal with those. I think a lot of people will find that very, very interesting and very inspiring. So thanks, thanks for coming along today. And I'm was that all right, was it? All the best. Yes, perfect.